have been uh, on the road doing this talk since January. I have gone from Greenwich to Old Lyme, from Thomaston to Devon, and it is so great to come home to the Darien Library and uh, see the hometown crowd. We are so blessed to have this library, not only for the books and DVDs and everything else it provides, but as a cultural resource. So I, I salute Mallory and all of her good work uh, in uh, arranging talks like this. So to the issues at hand, I am an avowed columnist, not communist, columnist. <laughs> and as a columnist, my job uh, every week is to combine journalism and commentary and opine on issues relating to transportation. My model is uh, Tom Friedman from the New York Times, who says that as a columnist, he is either in the heating business or the lighting business. The heating business being getting people emotionally engaged can't believe the amount of hate emails I get when I do my column. Uh, and the lighting business being, being informative and sharing actual information. So I hope to do a little bit of uh, both this evening. And as Mallory mentioned, I have been a commuter advocate, no longer a full-time commuter, thank God. But uh, I served on the Metro North Commuter Rail Council for 19 years uh, and then formed the Commuter Action Group in 2013. So here is my hypothesis for this evening. People should pay for transportation services they use. And out of this comes a premise that motorists are not paying their fair share. And the timing of today's talk is just dripping with irony, as I will explain as the, uh, as the day goes on from what happened today in uh, the legislature. So here's what we're talking about. This is the Fairfield County congested corridor. This is uh, the main line of Metro North, paralleling I-95. The green line is the Merritt Parkway. This is what the governor refers to as the parking lot, and this is what he refers to as the museum. And peeling off there is the branch line that goes to New Canaan, the Danbury branch, the Waterbury branch, and you can't see it from here, but going off from New Haven to New London is Shoreline East, and soon to open the New Haven to Hartford to Springfield line that'll be launched in June. So this is the area we're really talking about where most of the transportation crisis uh, occurs. We have the highest fares of any commuter railroad in the United States, and those fares continue to go up. They've gone up 55% since the year 2003. Bus fares have gone up almost 75%. Uh, and it's very expensive to use our mass transit system. Every time there's gonna be a fare increase, I go to the public hearings and the commuters stand up and say, that's it, I can't take anymore, I'm gonna stop taking the train, and ridership actually goes up, despite the fare increases, because we have a captive audience. Metro North carries something like 93% of all the people that are bound for New York City every day. I mean, what are you gonna do, drive? Put up with that traffic and pay for parking? No. So. It's a captive audience, there's no real alternative. You either take the train or you maybe telecommute. But who is taking the bus? Let's remember the people that are taking the bus. This is a, a chart that measures percentage of riders by income starting at under $10,000 and going out to 250,000 or more. So as you can see, more than half of the people that ride the bus in this state make less than $25,000. Contrast that ridership with the train where we've got people, a vast majority of people are making $150,000 to $250,000 a year. Keep those audiences in mind. You know, you do have an alternative if you're going, for example, from Darien to Greenwich. You could drive, or you could take the train. If you want to take the train, it's $2.75 one way. It's only 10 miles. And if you're driving 10 miles, you are, in effect, paying gasoline tax of 12 cents. Uh, the gasoline tax in this state is 25 cents a gallon. It has not changed since 1997. It's never been adjusted for inflation. So uh, if I'm driving my Camry and I get 20 miles to the gallon, I'm paying about 12 cents in gasoline tax. That's the cost of my driving on I-95 to get to, to Greenwich. If I want to go to New York City, it's a little more expensive, either by train or by driving, and that does not include the tolls within New York City. 
But I think I could argue that the choice given you here, you know, if you're going to be thrifty and you really want to save money, driving makes more sense than taking the train. And we should actually be doing what we can to encourage people to take mass transit. The real issue at hand is the Special Transportation Fund. And these slides that have the logo in the corner from the DOT are all DOT slides. This is their data, not mine. And this shows that where the, the money that we spend on transportation comes from, almost half of it, 49% of it, comes either from motor fuels or the oil company tax. And that's the problem because we are so dependent on the gasoline tax at this point. Out of those uh, monies that come in, the DOT operations cost 40% of their budget. Debt service is 42%. 42% of all the money we spend on transportation is paying off bonds that we've issued. Not just for construction, but we're at the point now we're actually issuing bonds to cover operating expenses. And where does the money go? The vast majority of it goes to transit services. And those transit services include buses and trains. Despite the, high fact, the, the fact that we pay the highest fares on Metro North of any commuter railroad in the United States, we're still not paying the total cost of those rides. We pay more of the cost because the subsidy is lower than anywhere else. But all of the riders on Metro North, especially on the branch lines, are heavily subsidized out of the Special Transportation Fund. And because the Special Transportation Fund is so tied to the gasoline tax, we have known for years that it's going to move into a deficit position. In about 2019, we're going to go from a, a positive to a negative line, and we're going to end up, by the year 2022, $338 million in the red. That can't happen. If the Special Transportation Fund goes into the red, the state can't issue bonds. It can't do a lot of other things that it wants to do. So we've known this crisis has been coming for years. Uh, we've been talking about it, but the legislature has done nothing. And they finally kicked that can down the street to this year, where the governor in December said, okay, you got to do something this year, because we can't have the special transportation fund go into a deficit. And he's literally held the legislature's feet to the fire and told them they've got to do something to solve this problem. So what's the problem with the special transportation fund? As I said, because it is so heavily tied to gasoline taxes, Cars are getting better mileage. We're seeing more electric cars. Anyone drive a Tesla here? Yeah, I did this talk in New Canaan, and a hand went up, and I said, well, you don't pay anything to drive on the highway. You pay no gasoline taxes at all. You're still ripping up the road like any other car, but uh, you don't have to pay anything. You're getting a free ride. There are estimates that something like 20% of all cars in the next 10 years will be electric, and they won't be paying a gasoline tax. I also remind you that the gasoline tax was lowered by the legislature 14 cents a gallon in 1997 in a highly politically popular move, which in the long run has cost us over $3 billion in money that we would have had to spend on transportation. And the gasoline tax, as I said, has not changed since 97. It's not been pegged to inflation. In other words, we can't have the special transportation fund be so reliant on a gasoline tax to fund our roads and our rails. The Special Transportation Fund is also something of a sieve. It has been regularly rated at uh, budget time by every governor going back in both parties for three or four terms to help balance the state's budget. There is a referendum coming up in November that will stop that by putting a lockbox on the Special Transportation Fund. But over the past 10 years, we've lost $400 million that was supposed to go to transportation, has been used to balance the state's budget. But that's $400 million out of $3.4 billion that we lost because the legislature lowered the gasoline tax. So the lockbox idea was actually suggested by the Republicans, and it will be a referendum question in November, and you'll have a chance to deal with it. In the meantime, we're looking at a budget that's going to start July 1st, and something has to be done before that budget goes into effect. And the DOT can only do certain things. The legislature can do others. Because if the Special Transportation Fund is headed into the red, as that chart I showed you earlier, that means the state cannot go to Wall Street looking for bonding for anything, transportation, environment, housing, et cetera. Because Wall Street knows that this economic sword of Damocles is hanging over the state's head. 
Our bond rating is down to an A. That might be good in high school, but it's not great when you're trying to pay uh, debt. A higher, lower bond rating means we have to pay higher interest rates. And the Special Transportation Fund has got to be fixed before July 1st. But, as I said, the DOT can only do two things. It can raise revenue by raising fares, and it can cut expenses. And the governor told the commissioner of the DOT to do both of those things. The legislature, however, can uniquely identify other revenue sources, tolls, taxes, etc. And that's where I think the responsibility should lie. Here's what the DOT has already announced that it was going to do to cut spending. They put $4.3 billion worth of engineering and construction projects on hold for five years. You know what kind of condition our roads are in now. Anything that was planned to improve or mitigate that, on hold. Funding that was going to help local municipalities has been cut. We were in uh, Old Lyme doing this talk a few months ago, and the first select woman said that they have a bridge in town that's going to be $600,000 to repair. They got to repair it. There's no choice. But they used to get 50% matching money from the state. Now they don't get it. So they have to pay it all themselves. And that means taxpayers in those towns are going to have to pay for that bridge repair. They've already had a 14% attrition in the number of jobs at the DOT. They have closed the rest areas on our highways, not the service areas, but the rest areas. They are now closed. They've reduced the maintenance staff. The commissioner said this winter, if we'd had a couple of bad blizzards back to back, he was afraid he wasn't gonna be able to clear the highways. On the bus side, 15% fare increase, 15% reduction in subsidy in some districts, 50% subsidy reduction in others, and that means less bus service and higher fares. On the train side, July 1st, there will be a 10% fare increase for all riders on Metro North, followed by an additional 5% fare increase next year and another 5% the year after that. Most painful of all, on top of a fare increase, they're talking about reducing service, especially on the branch lines. The Danbury, the Waterbury, and the New Canaan branch lines will only have rush hour service, no weekend service. And a 50% reduction on trains on Shoreline East. So my wife was joining me, we went out to Old Lyme, we drove along the coast and we looked at all those beautiful condos that are along the coast where people from the city come out and rent to enjoy the, the summer. But they're not gonna rent those condos if they can't get a train to get them to those towns. And if they're not going to rent those condos, what's going to happen to the people that own those condos and the taxes that they have to pay? People in New Canaan, three miles north of here roughly, uh, have their hair on fire because they're losing train service off peak. They could drive, I mean they could all call Ubers and come down to catch a train at Darien and Eroden Heights, but the local merchants who rely on those trains to get their employees there as shopkeepers, as hospitality people, and cooks, and housekeeping staff at places like the Roger Sherman Inn. The manager of the Roger Sherman Inn said, if we don't have train service off peak, we're going to have to close the Roger Sherman Inn. On the highway side, any number of projects, I've just highlighted a few here in red that are of local interest. The interchange where Route 7 meets the Merritt Parkway, that's on hold. The Hartford Viaduct project, I-84, that's on hold. Any ideas of widening I-95 between Stamford and Bridgeport, on hold. All of these projects are going to be put on the back burner because we don't have the money. On the public transportation side, this new Hartford line that's running between Hartford, New Haven, it's New Haven, Hartford, and Springfield was going to be double-tracked. They won't be able to finish that. Anybody remember the bar cars on Metro North? Ah, yes, the bar cars, the holy grail of Metro North. Uh, we have some new cars. We're getting some new M8 cars that will be delivered next year. Ten of those cars were going to be converted into cafe cars. That's not going to happen. The controversial Stamford Railroad Station parking garage, which is a whole story in and of itself, that's not going to happen. Uh, new Canaan branch improvements, no. Nope. Maintenance facility in New Haven, no. Nope. 
Replacing the old rail cars on Shoreline East, the Waterbury and the Danbury branches, not going to happen. All manner of projects that the DOT had in the pipeline are now literally being turned off at the spigot. But the good news is that after we stop spending $4.3 billion and we raise the fares and cut the service, the Special Transportation Fund is not going to be in the red. But we're not going to have the train service and we're going to have higher fares. So pick your poison in this case. So what will all of this mean if these draconian cuts go through? More traffic. Less trains, more traffic on 95 and on the Merritt. Worsening road conditions, because we're not repairing the bridges and the roads that we have today, those conditions are going to get worse. Anybody remember the collapse of the Mianus River Bridge? Great. I just want to show you this clip that I pulled from Channel 3 in Hartford about this very issue. Oops. It was the worst bridge disaster in Connecticut history. Three people died when part of the Mianus River Bridge in Greenwich collapsed. The investigation found that the state bridge inspectors failed to catch a badly rusted support. That was three decades ago. Tonight, there are hundreds of structurally deficient bridges here in Connecticut, according to the Federal Highway Administration, and chances are you regularly cross them. But the NBC Connecticut troubleshooters have learned that many of those bridges will not get fixed anytime soon. Sean Curry set out with drone rangers to find them. This bridge on I-95 in West Haven averages a whopping 138,000 crossings a day. It's one of over 330 bridges in the state deemed structurally deficient according to federal standards. You feel the bridge shake and it's sort of unnerving. Christina Boot owns a nearby business. She and her employees use the land under the bridge. Our employees that do pass through here uh, claim that they've seen things that have fallen off um, from underneath. Farther down Route 1, this drawbridge connects Milford to Stratford. Its most recent inspection report by the State Department of Transportation calls out heavy rust and perforated concrete so bad that the worst areas have up to 100% deterioration. 50 miles away in East Haddam, take a look at this corrosion. Drone Ranger got right up under the rusting floorboards of the historic swing bridge. Some support beams have holes where the steel has rusted right through. I'm standing here in the Sigourney Street Bridge in Hartford. Beneath us is Capitol Avenue, and then this bridge continues crossing under I-84. Every day, commuters cross this bridge over 10,000 times. Following the same route, but from underneath the deck, Drone Ranger found exposed rebar, long cracks, holes, and more rust. As soon as the, the rot or the deterioration gets down to rebar, then it becomes a problem because now the skeleton of the structure is, is falling apart. Travis Woodward is a project engineer with the Department of Transportation, and he's president of the union that represents other DOT engineers. You hear that thing? Nice and solid. When we get over here, it's going to sound like an empty cardboard box. The troubleshooters have learned that repairs for many of the state's deficient bridges won't be coming soon. Earlier this year, Governor Malloy canceled $4.3 billion worth of transportation projects, citing serious funding issues. Caught up in the mix were nearly $200 million worth of already scheduled repairs for these 32 structurally deficient bridges around the state. But Woodward says there would be more money for bridge repairs if the DOT ceased a decades-long practice of using outside consultants instead of using state employees for bridge work. A union analysis found nearly $150 million could have been saved in 2015 and 16 if that work was done in-house at the DOT. That's money we could be spending on fixing our bridges. I have to inspect bridges now. DOT Commissioner Jim Redeker doesn't believe the savings would be quite so substantial, but agrees the amount is significant. Still, he says he can't capitalize on those savings without extra funds to first make hires. Right now, we don't have enough funding to do the bridges or to hire the inspectors. DOT relies completely on the state's special transportation fund for its budget, and there are massive deficits in the fund. And Redeker says, without funding, our bridges and roads will keep getting worse. We will see deterioration happen very quickly. If a bridge becomes too fragile, Redeker says he'll have no choice but to close it off. Closing a bridge that happens to be a critical connection in some place in Connecticut. That should not happen. It's too important. Without an immediate influx of cash, Redeker expects the number of deficient bridges to rise. He says for now, driving over them is safe. 
warns that by putting off repairs, the state will pay more later. Christina Bood worries that a bridge closure could prove costly for her business and the community. So many people that aren't going to be able to get through from New Haven to West Haven. Finding new sources of revenue for the DOT is reviving the debate at the Capitol over higher gas taxes and highway tolls. Commissioner says tolls may be a good idea, but won't solve the funding problem fast enough. We put a list of all the state's structurally deficient bridges whose repairs were canceled on our website. To check out the bridges you use, visit NBCConnecticut.com and click on Troubleshooters. Sean Porter. So I checked that list today, and none of those bridges are in Darien. <laughs> but they are on 995. What we have already seen, if you're familiar with Westport, is the Krabari Bridge, which is right near the Sherman Island exit, I think it is. No, the downtown exit. Yeah, the downtown exit, Saugatuck. That bridge is now under weight restriction. The city of Westport cannot run its own fire trucks across that bridge. This is the first of what I think we will see as a growing trend, because the DOT is not going to allow another bridge collapse. They're going to err on the side of closing bridges. The other thing that all of these cuts will mean is less mobility for the car list, the people that don't really have a choice. They don't have a car. There isn't the bus service. The people we were talking to about earlier, the people that clean your house, that work in your shops, that are the staff at your local restaurants. Less transit also makes locations undesirable as a place to live. The chairman of the New Canaan Realtors Board said that house values in New Canaan will go down because they don't have the train service off-peak that they used to have. And if your property values go down, the real estate prices go down, that does not mean your taxes go down. The Board of Education is still going to be there looking for its annual increases. In fact, I think your local taxes will go up as property values go down and because the towns are now going to be responsible for repairing bridges that they used to get some money from the state to help with as well too. The other question is that once we, once we cut train service, you cannot just snap your fingers and restore it. If a Metro North locomotive engineer does not run a train for 30 days, he has to or she has to go back and get recertified. So this is not a service that we can toggle on and toggle off. Uh, if those train cuts go into effect July 1st, it's going to be a long time before we can restore them, assuming that money is found. And Donald Trump is not riding to the rescue. His trillion and a half dollars of infrastructure spending nets out to only $200 billion in federal money, and that will only go to states and municipalities that have matching funds. We have no matching funds. We're in a blue state. It may be red, but I don't think we're going to be counting on Uncle Sam or Uncle uh, Trump to come to our rescue. Uh, the, what he is proposing are what are called P3s, public-private partnerships, uh, working with private corporations to take over some of these infrastructure uh, investments. Uh, the track record on those in various parts of the country is really spotty. Who wants to privatize a decrepit bridge? Who wants to privatize Metro North, a railroad that loses money with every ride that it operates? Oh, and by the way, the president is also proposing a 25 cent federal gasoline tax increase on top of anything that the states do as well, too. We also have to remember that infrastructure is more than just crumbling bridges and roads. It's also our water supply, Aquarian Water Supply Company had to put a pipeline along the Merritt Parkway to make sure Greenwich didn't run out of water last year in the middle of a drought. So when we're spending money on infrastructure, I think I would even argue that water, <laughs> making sure water is available, is a little bit higher on the list of things to guarantee even over uh, mass transit. Airports, I mean our airports, as you know, look like something out of the third world. The electric grid, internet, all of these are infrastructure hands that will be extended in the direction of Washington for whatever kind of money is available. So what's the answer? These are not my ideas. These are ideas that were created and developed by the governor's transportation finance panel. When the governor had dreams of spending $100 billion 
for a 30-year transportation plan, really wasn't a plan, it was a list of projects, something for everyone in the state, there was no prioritization, nobody vetted it, we'll call it a plan. He didn't want his fingerprints on the cost side of things, so he created a blue ribbon panel and they studied all the different funding options. And here's what they came up with. Lockbox on the special transportation fund. Nobody is going to support a penny increase in anything if they're not 100% sure it will only be spent on transportation. You'll have a chance to vote on that in November. They also suggested that they get back into raising the gasoline tax a little bit each year to get it back to where the, where the level was in 1997 when the legislature reduced it 14 cents a gallon. That will bring in revenue very quickly. They also said they should increase the gross receipts tax on other petroleum products. That means maybe your heating oil is going to be a little more expensive as well, too. They also floated the idea, and this has been endorsed by the president as well, too, of what's called a vehicle miles tax. This is something that's being done in Oregon. It's being done in Europe. And what it suggests is, is that when you go to get your emissions check every two years and they look at your odometer, They'll do the math and they'll say, okay, Mr. Jones, in the last two years, you've driven 20,000 miles. Here's a bill for the 20,000 miles you've driven. That idea was immediately shot down, even by the Democrats. It was seen as a huge invasion of privacy. Forget the fact that you're driving around with one of these in your pocket that tells Google everywhere you have been the state doesn't care where you have been, they just want to know how much wear and tear you have done on the highways. So a vehicle miles tax I think makes sense, I think it's fair. It goes back to my hypothesis that people should pay for the services that they use, but that thing is dead on arrival. The legislature even passed a law forbidding the DOT from considering, examining, or even studying the issue. Which brings us to the T word. Tolls. Now, I have been toiling in this vineyard for many years in support of tolls. And I am still of the mind that I think it is a fair way of asking people to pay their fair share. But the revenue could be anywhere I've heard from $700 million to a billion and a half, depending on where the tolls are placed, how much the tolls are going to be. But what's important is that it would take two to four years to implement. Two to four years from the time the legislature said go to those tolls being, into effect, being put into effect. Not the least of which is because, believe it or not, the federal government would require the DOT to do an environmental impact study for every toll gantry that they put up over the highway. I mean, they could put up a sign that says exit 10 two miles, but if they're going to put up a toll gantry with electronic easy pass readers on it, they have to do an environmental impact study. So that would take two to four years to implement. That was what was up for a vote today in the legislature. And the majority leader pulled the bill because he realized he didn't have enough votes. So there will not be a vote on tolls this year. And which brings me to my favorite part of this presentation. Uh, this is the light part where I'm going to overcome some of the objections that you might have heard from people that are opposed tolling. The federal government won't let us do it. That is not true. Connecticut is one of 15 states that would be allowed by the federal government to put in tolls not just as a revenue source, but as a traffic mitigation tool. Time of day pricing would discourage people from being on the highway at rush hour the same way we offer peak and off-peak fares on Metro North. What we have is a limited supply of roadway and we have a flexible demand. If you want to go see a movie on a Saturday night, it costs more than going to see it on a Tuesday afternoon. And it should cost more to be on that highway at the peak rush hours uh, uh, than it does to go in the middle of the night. And you could use these tolls to make trucks face the economic reality of huge tolls if they were going to be on that highway in the middle of rush hour. Let's prioritize the road to get people to and from their jobs and encourage the truckers to go a little bit off peak. So, no, there's no problem with the federal government allowing us to do that. Another great idea. Let's just toll out-of-state vehicles. 
You know, everybody thinks that the solution to our problem is to make somebody else pay for it. Don't tax you, don't tax me, tax that guy behind the tree. Uh, well, we're all responsible for driving on these highways, and I think we should be responsible for helping pay for it. It's unconstitutional to only tax out-of-state vehicles. You can offer a discount to people who are residents of Connecticut. You can offer an even bigger discount for Connecticut residents who are regular commuters. So that's okay. The corollary is, let's just do border tolls. This was the suggestion of the chairman of the Transportation Committee who lives in Rocky Hill. Sure, make the people that live on the borders pay the tolls. The people in Greenwich, they're all billionaires. They don't care we're going to pay tolls. Make them pay for it. Well, they, the thinking behind this was that something like 34% of all the traffic that is on Interstate 95 is just passing through the state. They're out-of-staters. And right now, they're getting a free ride the only state in New England that does not have tolls. And I think they should be paying their fair share. But I don't think you should be trying to toll them at the borders. I suggested that a more logical place would be the Connecticut River runs right up and down the middle of the state. Why don't you put a toll on every bridge that goes across the Connecticut River? That was in the chairman of the Transportation Committee's district, and he didn't think that was a great idea. Traffic, <laughs> tolls cause slower traffic and cause accidents. Well, it's been 30 years since the fiery truck crash at Stratford that everybody points to as the reason that we got rid of tolls. Um, I have some knowledge about toll collecting. I spent three years in college as a toll collector on the Tappan Zee Bridge. I got really good at rolling quarters. Uh, and I never saw a fiery truck crash. Trucks do not drive into toll booths. Partly because there are no toll booths anymore. They tore down my toll booths on the Tappan Zee Bridge. It's all done electronically with gantries now. So you don't have to slow down. Drive on the Jersey Turnpike, the Garden State Parkway, go up to Boston on the uh, Mass Pike. You can go at speed and still pay your toll. So there's no slowing down or worrying about people causing accidents. Favorite one of mine. Tolls will clog local roads. Well. Maybe for the first week or so, people will be cheapskates and say, OK, I'm going to go up the Boston Post Road instead of going on the highway because I can avoid a 25 cent toll. And you'll be in bumper to bumper traffic and you'll say, hmm, do I want to be 25 cents uh, to the wiser or do I really want to get to where I'm going? And I think people will see the value in paying tolls and those that don't need to be on the highway, that don't choose to pay the tolls, will not be in the cars in front of you. You will get a faster ride if the tolls are on the highway. I don't know where this one came from, but our highways should all be freeways. I've reviewed the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. There is no reference in there to any constitutional right to free access to the highways. I mean, there's more than the cost of the wear and tear that we place on the roads. There's the environmental cost of driving your car in bumper-to-bumper -bumper conditions. There's the psychological effect of driving to work and it taking you, what did you say you spent from White Plains today? Uh, One hour from White Plains to Darien. Um, fortunately, she doesn't really have much of an alternative at this point as well, too. Uh, another great objection, but we already pay car taxes. Yes, we do, but that goes to the towns and the cities. It does not pay for transportation. The towns and the cities use your personal property as a way of raising more money by taxing it. It's nothing to do with transportation. And this is the one that makes me nuts. Tolls are a tax. No, they are not. Tolls are a user fee. If tolls are a tax, are train fares a tax? No, train fares are paid by people who choose to take the train. If you don't want to pay a toll on the highway, don't be on the highway. Take the train. Join us. Paying the highest fares on any commuter railroad in the United States. So this argument that tolls are a tax is just fake news. And I put it to you with this political cartoon, this question. Aren't we already paying tolls? The sign says, welcome to Connecticut, tolls in effect. Bent blown tire, $200. Bent rim, $399. 
damage suspension, $200 to $2,000, and there's I-95. You can pay Midas Muffler, or you can pay the state, but there is no free ride. And I put it to you that I think the tolls are a fair way of asking people who use our highways to pay their fair share, because I certainly know that people that take mass transit are paying their fair share. So I've gone on with heat and light for a little bit. I'm happy to answer any questions or hear your points of view as well, too. Yes, sir. Uh, I think there's a couple of very easy fixes. Uh, the first is that we have a, a tax on the sale of new cars, which is at this point going into the general fund. I believe it was last year the legislature voted that in 2021 or 22, that money would go into the special transportation fund. That could easily be redirected into the special transportation fund now. I think we could also raise the gasoline tax, two cents, four cents, I don't know, a little bit. Gasoline prices are not that high as compared to what they've been in the past. I think those two moves alone, from what the DOT tells me, would be enough to fend off the fare increases in the service cuts that uh, are being proposed. But I don't think the legislature is going to necessarily do either of those. Yes, sir? So what's going to happen to the Stanford parking garage situation? So let me give you uh, just a five-minute synopsis on the Stanford parking garage because I think it's illustrative of the fact that the DOT doesn't have a great track record when it comes to transit-oriented development. The parking garage next to the train station was built at the same time as the train station, and I think that was maybe 35 years ago. Uh, as the station was being built, it was realized that it, there was faulty construction, bad concrete, so they fixed the station and they went ahead and they built the garage, which immediately started to crumble. But 10 years ago, when I was on the commuter council, the DOT came to us and said, we know we're going to have to do something with this old garage. And we're going to study it. Of course, let's study it. Uh, we can study things to death in this state without making a decision. Uh, we're going to study it. And after they studied it, they said it would actually cost more money to repair it than to replace it. So they were going to tear it down and build a new garage. Now, that garage is in an ideal location because it's right next to the train station. You can get out of your car, go across that bridge, boom, you're on a train, very convenient. Not only for commuters, but for Amtrak passengers as well, too. Then somebody at the DOT said, you know, that piece of land where the garage is sitting is certainly valuable. If we put up like, uh, you know, a mixed use office building or something there, we could make a ton of money. So they sold the crown jewels. They said, we're gonna lease this plot of land to a private developer for 99 years, and they can put up something. We'll make money off of the rent, um, and we'll just move the parking a quarter mile away. You know, they'll have some parking for the tenants in their building or a hotel or whatever it's going to be. So they signed a deal, no, they, they announced a deal with a local developer, a gentleman that lives here in Darien, as a matter of fact, four years ago, and three and a half years later, they had still not signed a contract. That developer, this is my opinion, played the DOT like a bad violin they dragged them on for three and a half years of negotiations as they dealt with weakened real estate demand, lack of funding for their own project, till finally the DOT said, enough, and they said the project is dead. In the meantime, they had to close the garage completely because concrete was falling on the roof of cars. As they closed the garage, they lost the income from the, the spaces that were being used there. Fortunately, a new garage, a private garage, had opened on Washington Boulevard, and they allowed Peter commuters who had permits to park over there, but the DOT had to subsidize the difference between what they were being paid and what the private rate was going to be. Long story short, they've only opened up half of that old garage again. They're talking about doing another public-private partnership, um, and maybe this time they'll do it right because they got the city of Stanford so incensed by basically thumbing their nose at the city and saying, you have no say in this project whatsoever, and they said, but it's our neighborhood, uh, they're gonna have to come up with some sort of a solution. Meantime, the private garage over there has now, I think, doubled their rates. And again, you don't have much choice. If you wanna take the train out of Stanford, what are you gonna do? And that, if they can't find parking at Stanford, you're gonna come up and park at Neroden Heights, or Glenbrook, or Springdale, or Darien. 
So there's like a, what I called a, uh, a commuter diaspora of people <laughs> wandering around looking for a way to get to their jobs. And that's why we moved here, isn't it? I mean, this town would not exist if it wasn't for that train. My wife and I chose to live here because the train service was there. Not just because of the great schools and the beaches and the beautiful flora and fauna, but transportation, I mean, the Gold Coast of Connecticut is so reliant on that transportation being there, being reliable, being affordable, that if anything happens to that, it's gonna have a huge economic impact. So if I could summarize your question, why can't Metro North make money? And why do they operate in the arrogant way that they do? Uh, let me take the second one first. Uh, <laughs> This is something I've been involved with for 25 years, dealing with the arrogance, the lack of responsiveness of management, of staff, of conductors, of engineers. Um, and I think it all comes from the answer to the first part of your question, which is it's a monopoly. Those are contracts that were made. We have conductors who are making $100,000 a year. And uh, somebody signed those contracts. Somebody made those deals. And it's kind of hard to go back on that. Now, I did ask several years ago when service in the winter was getting at its absolute worst and the railroad was pretty much melting down in the middle of the, of the winter, I asked the question that nobody had asked, and that is, why don't we fire Metro North? We hire, the Connecticut DOT hires Metro North to run our trains. Um, they are a vendor to us, and we met, represent more of Metro North's income running trains in Connecticut than they make from the running their own trains on the Hudson and the Harlem lines. So we are a very p important piece of their business. However, we are under a contract with them, goes back to 30, 35 years ago. It has been arbitrated twice, the first time by Leon Jaworski of Watergate fame, and each time the DOT has gone to arbitration trying to seek a better deal, uh, we ended up getting a worse deal. Uh, we ended up paying more of the cost of the subsidy ourselves. So we could fire Metro North with one year's notice, but uh, then what do you do? Uh, it's not like you go down to Starbucks and say, anybody want to run a train? You'd probably end up with some of the same engineers dealing with the same unions. What's, I think, interesting is that the DOT, when they were looking for an operator for the new line that's running from New Haven to Hartford to Springfield, did not choose Amtrak, whose tracks it's, those trains are running on, did not choose Metro North. They chose a new startup from Massachusetts that has some European routes, I believe, as well, too. So that kind of put the fear of whomever in the other operating agencies saying, well, maybe there would be an option for someone else to run Metro North. But I think we're pretty much stuck with what we've got at this point. Um, the only ray of sunshine and the hope that I can afford is, this is gonna sound a little parochial, but uh, the new guy who's running the MTA came from Toronto, my hometown, and he has a great track record at uh, customer service. And I think I'm already seeing uh, a change in their communication patterns, a little more forthcoming, a little more honesty in explaining why there are delays as well, too. But, uh, you know, if there was money to be made running Metro North, I guess I would ask why somebody hasn't stepped forward and said, uh, yeah, we'll run the trains. I mean, if every train fare is subsidized by about 25% on the main line, so you'd be looking at at least a 25% fare increase, more like a 50% fare increase, given the current cost structure, for a private operator to be able to do that at a profit. And I'm not sure if ridership wouldn't be affected by making it that expensive. Yes, sir. There was a study, I believe it came out of either the Reason Foundation or the Yankee Institute, which uh, let's just say did not uh, rank Connecticut's Department of Transportation favorably compared to other states. Uh, I'm still skeptical of how poorly we ranked in that uh, ranking. Uh, the states that did fairly well on that list uh, tend to be states with they don't have a mass transit system that's run by their Department of Transportation. 
and they're in states that have much higher mortality rates on their highways. So uh, are there savings to be made in the way the DOT operates? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, just drive along 95 and look at the work crews that are out there. You know, you look and you say, there's six guys standing around watching one guy with a shovel. And, you know, intuitively you go, somebody's wasting money here. I, yeah, of course, I'll give you that. Uh, are we talking about 50% waste? 25% waste? I don't know. I think money can be saved, but I don't think it's going to necessarily be the overall solution to the larger problem that we're dealing here, because we're looking at billions of dollars worth of remediation. Yes, sir. Okay. How can, how can we attract business to the state when uh, the traffic is so bad and the taxes are so high? Um, Stamford has currently, guess what the vacancy rate in downtown office space is in Stamford? 37%, I've heard. A lot of see-through office space down there. Take Swiss Bank, for example, the world's largest trading floor that's sitting there. Um, who's going to move in there if they come up from New York or California or whatever and go, nice place, nice piece of real estate, and look, it's so close to the train station. Those Swiss, they were very smart putting this so close to the train station. But what's that out there? That parking lot. <laughs> it's 10 o'clock in the morning, and there's bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. Come back at 2 o'clock. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. There's no traffic moving out there. Yeah, uh, Joe McGee of the Fairfield Business Council, who, whom I respect and knows more about these issues than I do, served with me on the Commuter Council. He was Commissioner of Economic Development under Weicker. He worked with Stuart McKinney when he was in the Senate. Uh, you know, he's now in the, he's got the unenviable job of trying to attract businesses to come to Fairfield County. Uh, he maintains that the complaints that they have are not about taxes. They are about infrastructure. They don't want to set up shop in a place like Stamford where their employees can't afford to live in the community. I mean, affordable housing or lack thereof is the reason people are driving up and down these highways. If they could afford to live in Stamford, they wouldn't be on that car, in that car in front of you driving on the highway. So he maintains that we've got to do something about transportation. And I think that the way of dealing with traffic on I-95, <clears throat> in addition to time of day pricing, is to get people out of their cars and onto the train. Get more parking at the train stations up the line. Get more shuttle buses running from each town to the local businesses. You know, there's nothing more satisfying to me when I'm on a train and I go flying past bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic at 80 miles an hour and the traffic's going bumper-to-bumper. -bumper. I mean, at some point, people are going to say, I think I should try taking the train, assuming they can get a parking space at Fairfield or wherever it is that they, they live and get from downtown Stanford to wherever their, their employer is. So I think if we got people on the train, there'd be less traffic on the highway. Yes, ma'am. I don't want to get into the politics of this. I think that there is opposition among Republicans and maybe some Democrats as well too. But this is why I've been going across the state and doing this talk to try and explain the situation that we're in, what the alternatives are, and why I think tolls make sense. And I'm up against a huge disinformation campaign run by any number of people who have been trying to argue that tolls are a tax and we can't tax people anymore. Um, I th what can you do? I think you can call your state rep, call your state senator, and say, how would you vote on this issue if it came up? Uh, if you would vote against it, why? Uh, what are the alternatives? And most importantly, if we're not going to have tolls or a gasoline tax increase, how are they going to stop these fare increases and service cuts starting July 1st. I believe that both parties have in their budget what I refer to as a shell game. They're gonna move some money around, they're gonna put out the necessity of these fare increases and service cuts July 1st, but they have kicked the can down the road once again because they're not dealing with a systemic problem. They may solve the crisis and claim victory so they can go into the fall campaign saying, I stopped tolls or I saved the trains. But that chart is not going to change if we don't do something
to find other sources of income for the special transportation fund? Yes, sir. Subsidizing them? You mean charging less tax or, or getting people to buy? Oh, subsidizing the pur purchase price of them. <laughs> you have children. Don't you care about the children and the rising sea level? There was a movie in here last week about the uh, global warming and things like that. Um, uh, you've raised a number of issues. I, ag I, I agree with you that public transportation is a public service and that we, were, if money to was, who was asking about making, you were asking about me about making money off the trains. If there was money to be made off of operating a private railroad, the New Haven Railroad would not be out of business. It would not have gone bankrupt years ago. Uh, I, I know of one for-profit, no, two. I know of two for-profit railroads in the United States. One is the Durango and Silverton steam train in Durango, California, uh, Colorado, which charges 100 bucks to go five miles on an old steam train. They're making money. And the other is a new service that's just started in Florida called Brightline that is being run by a, a private consortium, uh, running trains eventually between Miami and Orlando, high-speed trains at uh, commuter-like intervals, and they think they can make money. Not off of the operation of the train, but as they do in Hong Kong, off of the development of the stations and the property around them. The Hong Kong subway system makes oodles of money because they own all the land where their stations are. And they put up malls and office buildings, and they make more money off of the, the real estate, st estate side of things than they do off of moving passengers. So uh, subsidizing the price of gas guzzlers, I don't know. We have time for maybe two more questions, and then we've got to wrap up. In the back there, yes, ma'am. This year? Neither one. You've caught me in the moment of pessimism. I'm really discouraged by today's uh, lack of, of a vote. I, I'm not sure what the solution is going to be that will forestall these service cuts and fare increases, but both budgets have some sort of, as I call it, a shell game. But I don't think that either one of them will come through. Certainly not tolls. I don't see tolls after what happened today. I don't see that having a... Uh, prayer until maybe next year. But you know what they say about democracy? Um, people get the government they deserve, right? You elect these people and you deserve what you get from them. Um, people are going to, they have just voted through persuasion of their elected officials and they have just built themselves their future in terms of looking at closed bridges, rotten bridges, uh, delays on the highways, delays on the trains. So you asked for it. You don't want to pay a gas tax? You don't want to pay tolls? Enjoy the ride, everybody. Uh, in the corner, yes, way back there, sir. Okay, is the lockbox airtight, and would it actually give people cover to vote for tolls? Uh, there are Republicans who think that the wording of the referendum is not strong enough. Uh, I have asked the commissioner of the DOT, Mr. Redeker, who you saw in that video, and whose opinion I respect, and he said, uh, what's the old saying, you know, perfection is the enemy of good enough? He said it's not perfect, but it's strongly worded enough that you would have to have a pair of brass cojones as a lawmaker to do anything dipping into the special transportation fund if that goes into effect. Now, you know, under the world of hypothetical what-ifs, uh, what if we had a special transportation fund that was rock solid, airtight, impermeable, and developed a couple of billion dollars in there, <clears throat> and suddenly there was another superstore in Sandy that wiped out our coastal communities? And the only money that we had was sitting waiting to be spent on repairing bridges upstate. So I think, there's, as I understand it, there is some flexibility in that fund, but I don't think it would be misused, especially given the debate that we'll see coming up to November and the, the appetite, that, the lack of appetite that people will have to, to spend anything on tolls or taxes if that money is not going to be properly spent. You know, 10 years ago, when they lowered the gasoline tax, 14 cents a gallon, I was standing at the pump filling my tank. I don't know how much gas was, like 350 or something back then. And they were talking about, yeah, we're going to lower the gasoline tax. And I said, you know, I wonder where this money goes. You know, if they actually put a sticker on that gas pump and said, 
here's the gasoline tax, here's what it pays for, people wouldn't resent it. But because it just kind of falls into some black hole up there in Hartford, people did resent it. And that's why it made it so popular to reduce that gasoline tax. But from the tone I'm getting from some of the questions here today and the tenor of the emails that I read on a regular basis, um, this state is just so divided. There are so many people here who hate this state, who say, that's it, I'm out of here, I can't stand it. I went to the swap shop at a, up at the dump recently, and there was a young man there, three or four years out of college, who was offloading all kinds of stuff. And I said, what's going on? He, he's been living at home since he graduated. <clears throat> he said, my parents are moving. This is the way they're getting them out of the house. I said, where are they going? North Carolina, he said. Great, wonderful. He said, everybody is leaving the state. I said, did they sell the house? Oh yeah, we sold the house. <laughs> no, somebody else is moving in. Somebody else is moving in to enjoy our schools and our beaches and our golf courses and our country clubs and our library. And there's not a mass exodus. I hope there's a mass exodus of people that are so fed up because it'll mean less traffic on the highway in front of me. <laughs> I want to thank you all very much for your time. I'll hang out and answer any questions.